Some experts believe that the United States is on the verge of some serious civil unrest and maybe even a civil war. For many, the threat of violence and the decay of state institutions spells the end to any semblance of a good life. But for anarchists, it tends to mean that things are finally going their way. Although anarchism is a diverse philosophy that stretches across the political spectrum, most followers believe in the abolition of state control and the use of violence as a means to an end. Anarchists nowadays might lurk online forums or host podcasts. However, there was a time in America when anarchism was a legitimate, coherent movement that consistently planned assassinations, incited riots, and openly challenged the government. The figure who took center stage? Emma Goldman, an anarchist who planned assassinations, helped out in the Spanish Civil War, and went to prison multiple times. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. I was kind of in a funk for a while. I think it was because I wasn't challenging myself enough. And then I remembered when I was a kid and I used to always read books on learning new skills, whether it was stop motion animation or basketball. There was something about pushing myself to learn new things that made me pretty happy. Why not try that again? That's why I'm happy to introduce Skillshare, the sponsor of this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of amazing classes for anyone who is curious, self-motivated, and wants to learn new skills. Any specific skill you're trying to learn and Skillshare will have a dedicated course just for you. I was especially interested in updating my filmmaking knowledge. I started looking through Nathaniel Drew's courses on online content creation and especially found his video How to Speak Confidently on Camera, a guide for content creators to be super useful since I am pretty uncomfortable having to film myself. I can't wait to show you my progress over the next few months. Some benefits I really appreciate with Skillshare is that it's ad-free keeping you in the zone. There are also new premium classes launched every week so there's always something new to discover. And the entire catalog is available with subtitles in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German. Remember that your best investment is in yourself. For those who would like to invest in themselves, the first 1,000 people to use the link will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. Born into poverty in what would become Lithuania, Emma Goldman was regularly whipped by her father and abused by school teachers. In fact, all of Goldman's childhood could be characterized by violence and abuse. After witnessing a peasant being whipped, she appeared to have reached her limits, developing a lifelong distaste for anything that appeared to be violent authority. Her love of learning was largely discouraged by her father. When she asked him if she could attend school, he simply threw her books in a fire and told her that girls do not need to learn much except for preparing fish and giving man plenty of kids. Nonetheless, Goldman was able to self-study, learning of the nihilist movement in Russia that had recently murdered Alexander II. Additionally, she had read What is to be Done, a book in which a woman adopts nihilism, escapes from her awful family, and organizes a co-op. This theme of freedom and ending oppression would follow her throughout her life. After threatening to drown herself in a river if her dad said no, he finally let Goldman move to New York, where she worked as a seamstress. She would marry a fellow worker and they would bond over complaining about the working conditions. However, she then discovered he was impotent and their marriage ended within a year. She would move to New York City where she met other radicals at a cafe. Alexander Berkman and Johann Most. Most would train her in public speaking, a talent that she quickly mastered. However, she also quickly realized that her job was simply to parent Most views, and grew to dislike his command over her. After her and Berkman, now dating, opened up an ice cream shop, they then decided to try their hand in assassinating people. After learning of Henry Frick, a steel plant manager who killed many union workers in a protest, they created a plan. Berkman would kill Frick and Goldman would prostitute herself in order to pay for the scheme. The assassination was to inspire a larger labor movement against capitalists. The plan went okay. Goldman was given $10 by a man who seemed interested but then quickly told her that she didn't have the knack for the business. Berkman managed to get into Frick's office and beat him unconscious 
but he did not die. He would remain in prison for 22 years. When Most heard of the couple's shenanigans, he made a public denouncement. Goldman invited Most to an event, where she publicly whipped him for betraying the movement. Goldman's popularity soon grew. She spoke in front of crowds of disgruntled workers, urging them to take action. One time, her words were so poignant that she was charged for inciting a riot, leaving her in prison for a year. Well there, she was able to study medicine, and when she was released, she was able to attain the job of a midwife all the while pursuing her interest in anarchy. Goldman also had a role in Theodore Roosevelt's presidency. In 1901, a disgruntled registered Republican shot U.S. President William McKinley. When interrogated, he claimed that one of Goldman's speeches inspired him. He had actually stalked Goldman beforehand, trying to be her friend. This was enough for the police to also detain Goldman, and while she stated that she was not involved, she refused to condemn the assassination. Roosevelt, the vice president, would take office and express disdain for anarchism. After this turbulent period, Goldman would become very depressed, create a magazine called Mother Earth, which published articles from anarchists around the world, and eventually become reacquainted with the recently released Berkman. However, this wouldn't last very long, as Berkman would begin having an affair with a 15-year-old girl. Goldman, after a short period of grief, fell in love with the hobo doctor, a man who was homeless and earned a medical degree treating the poor. However, this relationship also ended. Berkman and Goldman, after some time, decided to try the whole anarchy thing out again by protesting against the conscription, and were promptly imprisoned for two years. Afterwards, they were deported to Russia, where they witnessed the aftermath of the Bolshevik Revolution. Although initially supportive, she was disappointed by the lack of free speech and unethical treatment of workers. Lenin reportedly told Goldman that there could be no free speech in a revolutionary period. They traveled between England and Canada after this period. Goldman would publish her most famous work, Living My Life, at an egregiously affordable price. Although Goldman was met with rave reviews, this brief period of happiness was soured by Berkman taking his own life. In grief, she decided to move to Spain and live with anarchists during the Spanish Civil War. However, the anarchists and communists soon grew to despise each other. Goldman felt that working with the communists would betray those suffering in Stalin's camps. The unrest between the groups led to her return to Canada in 1939. And, after suffering a stroke that left her speechless, Emma Goldman would pass away in Toronto at the age of 70. For Goldman, her entire philosophy centers around anarchy. For her, anarchism stands for a social order based on the free grouping of individuals for the purpose of producing real social wealth, an order that will guarantee to every human being free access to the earth and full enjoyment of the necessities of life, according to individual desires, tastes, and inclinations. This meant the abolition of religion, property, and government, entailing a radical redistribution of resources. But how could one achieve such aims? At first, Goldman was comfortable with the use of targeted violence as a means to an end. She felt that violence could encourage the masses to finally take action, as evident in the planned Frick assassination. She also felt that such violence was inevitable, a natural consequence of institutions that repress and deny the basic needs of individuals. She writes, the accumulated forces in our social and economic life, culminating in an act of violence, are similar to the terrors of the atmosphere, manifested in storm and lightning. However, after her time in Soviet Russia, Goldman grew skeptical of such consequentialist thinking. She felt that, well targeted violence is necessary, that to make violence a habit is to make the end product itself violent. She felt that Russia had made violence the very principle of its social struggle. Such terrorism begets counter-revolution, and in turn itself becomes counter-revolutionary. This turning away from suffering reflects a larger belief espoused by Goldman, an enjoyment of life as a driving force of anarchism. 
When criticized for dancing and partying a little bit too much by fellow radicals, she reminded them that the cause does not stand for some beautiful ideal that denies life and joy. Rather, it stood for freedom, the right to self-expression, everybody's right to beautiful, radiant things. To cut such elements out would be to leave the movement soulless. From this, she argued for a focus on the present as a driving force for anarchism. I don't care if a man's theory for tomorrow is correct. I care if his spirit of today is correct. Her philosophy of anarchism was largely tied to her rejection of capitalism and its incompatible relationship with freedom. Goldman argues that property only recognizes its own gluttonous appetite for greater wealth. This is dangerous, as, according to her, wealth signifies domination and power, a power that seeks to subdue, enslave, and degrade. The fact that most of the world runs on such logic makes it all the more clear as to why workers feel alienated working within the confines of capitalism. They become mere particles of the capitalist machine, losing their freedom for the sole purpose of circulating wealth and ensuring their own domination. Anarchy is the means to liberation. Nonetheless, Goldman was a realist at times. She notes one worker who challenged her idealism during a speech. His words left her to reflect on the utopian ideals of anarchism. He said that he understood my impatience with such small demands as a few hours less a day or a few dollars more a week. But what were men of his age to do? They were not likely to live to see the ultimate overthrow of the capitalist system. Were they also to forego the release of perhaps two hours a day from the hated work? That was all they could hope to see realized in their lifetime. The state was yet another threat to human freedom, as she saw it entirely as a tool for domination. For example, she argued that voting gave the illusion of choice, keeping people happy in the ignorant contentment that their voices are being heard when in fact all politicians shared the same desire for power and maintaining the class structures. Throughout her life, she would never vote, even during the formation of the Spanish Liberal Republic. She would also criticize the prison system, a system that she was personally familiar with. Goldman believed that all crime was a natural outgrowth of an unjust economic system, and prisons only served to keep people in their economic positions. Here she illustrates a grim picture. Year after year, the gates of prison hells returned to the world an emaciated, deformed, willish shipwrecked crew of humanity with the cane mark on their foreheads, their hopes crushed, all their natural inclinations thwarted. With nothing but hunger and inhumanity to greet them, these victims soon sink back into crime as the only possibility of existence. Although Goldman today is celebrated as a feminist, she was seen as an antagonist to the movement at the time. She was highly critical towards early feminism, seeing it as rigidly confined to the social forces of capitalism. She was also pessimistic that women voting would lead to any positive change. As she argued, to assume, therefore, that she would succeed in purifying something which is not susceptible of purification is to credit her with supernatural powers. Instead, Goldman can be credited with advocating for anarcho-feminism, which sought to resist patriarchy alongside the state and class divisions. Emma Goldman lived an incredibly interesting life, one filled with suffering, triumph, and constant movement. She was also a thinker who was willing to change their views when confronted with new information, and simultaneously hold steadfast in supporting her views that were wildly unpopular at the time. Love her or hate her, Goldman made her mark on American history as well as anarchism as a philosophy.